Today we're going to talk about the Shear Center. Now before we get to what the Shear Center is, let's take a look at a few shapes that the Shear Center isn't really something that you have to worry about. That's supposed to be symmetrical. Um, if you've got an I-beam, I-beams are great for bending. You've got a lot of mass out on these flanges, but they're not great for twist. Any open shape that you have, even if you have, say, a tube shape that is open right here, this will be awful in bending. It has almost no torsional stiffness. So we don't want to induce torsion on this shape. Similarly, we don't want to induce torsion on an I-beam. I-beams are awful under torsion, and oftentimes you would have to then weld a plate on here to give it a little bit of torsional stiffness. But ignoring that plate for a second, if we want to not induce torsion on this beam, we need to make sure that the load comes down centered. If instead we have an I-beam, hopefully this one will be more symmetrical. That's a weird looking I-beam, but that'll do. And we impose our loads way out here. Some form of a kicker coming off of there. We're getting not just the direct shear, but we're imparting a twist on that beam. We don't want to impart a twist on the beam. So, when it comes to symmetrical shapes, we need to make sure that that load comes down through the center. However, when we have asymmetrical shapes, the most common being a channel, where do I put the load? The centroid is somewhere in here. But if I put the load right here, this beam is actually still going to twist. We need to find where we can impose this load so that we don't twist this. And it turns out that for a C-shape, the shear center, the point that we can impose this load without twisting, is out here. We can find this by investigating the resultant shear forces in each component here, which if you remember from your basic mechanics and materials classes, at any free boundary, your shear is equal to zero. So we've got no shear on these free ends, and from continuity we know that the shear here is equal to the shear there coming around this bend. And turns out that you've got a linear progression of shear coming around these bends. And you've got a big quadratic shear coming through there, or parabolic. On a rectangle, your shear force is distributed like that, because again, the free boundaries have to be zero shear. So, in, oh, this is backwards. If we have a channel, we'll switch colors here. We impose a load that has to be resisted by an internal shear along here that's a big parabolic distribution. And from some of our forces in the y direction equal to zero, we know that this external force V and the integral over that area of shear, V is equal to the integral over that area of the shear force. However, right here, at both of those locations, we've still got some shear force going on. So we've got a little bit of shear produced along here, and a little bit produced along here. We're going to get a couple here, and we're going to get a couple 
here. This should be more horizontal. B top is equal to the integral of our shear force over that area. And we'll integrate over this bottom area as well and come out with the area under this shear curve equal to V bottom. And if we've got a symmetrical shape, we know that the shear center is going to be located on that axis of symmetry. So if we were also applying a shear force this way, we know it needs to be smack in the middle so that we don't impart an asymmetric shear and an eccentric shear on here and twist it that direction. But if we're coming down this way, we're going to end up with some eccentricity times, we're going to end up with some eccentricity times V, and that has to equal out to V top times the distance here between the top and the bottom. Distance top to bottom. And that's to the midpoint of each one of these. So dividing through, that is going to give us that the eccentricity off to this V force from the mid thickness of the flange, eccentricity is equal to V top times our distance, we'll just shorten that distance, divided by V applied. What is V top? Switch back to red, black here. V top is the integral of our shear force over this top area. Now, what is our shear force tau? That is equal to VQ over IT, where V is our applied shear force, Q is the polar moment of area, I is the moment of inertia of the shape, and T is the thickness. Q is equal to whatever area is in question times the distance separating the area from the centroid. And if we grab just that top flange, and we say that this variable here is S, and we're investigating Q of S is equal to the thickness of that flange times s times, and our distance is going to be, if we come back up here and call this h over 2 and the full height h, then that will be h over 2 minus t over 2 quantity, which gives us our q of s, and we would integrate this puppy, or more accurately, T of S, integrated over the area of the top flange. Then we would substitute that in for this V top. We've got our distance separating the top and bottom flanges. That is going to be H minus T. And our V applied is just V. So knowing that, we can go through and solve. If you have a more complicated shape, say you've got several flanges all coming off of a midpoint here, give it a little thickness. You 
shear center will be where everything comes through because the resultant shear force of each one of these has to come to that single point. If you've got more shapes, then we'll have to use the sum of moments is equal to zero to come up with your final result.